And therefore, you almost get marginalized when you start saying that it's a bad thing, people start laughing at you. And that's typically what's happening in societies where today, for example, we have moved, the pendulum has moved from a whole scale where decency for a person could include an individual who's very scantily dressed in public. Okay? And very exposed to allude to the idea of some sexual innuendo when in fact it can be decent. Because some can argue, well, it's not the outer garb, it's what's in my heart. And these are arguments that people constantly have, and that we will continue to have, and it's a healthy conversation. And it's beautiful that even if a human being wants to reject the moral prescriptions of a divine authority, I think it's very good, because at least the power of free will is intact. But where we need to take action as believers, as human beings, is to try to examine from a bird's eye position a universal goodness. A lot of times what we find is that our goodness is bounded within our boundaries. So what's good for me in my house and my family should be good for everybody. And in my opinion, that's very myopic in vision for a human being who thinks that way. And the ability of an individual to put themselves in other people's shoes while we make comments about what we think is right is fundamentally essential for us to reach what we call an equal, I mean, uh, in other words, harmony and acceptance on the moral principle. And what Allah SWT has incredibly created us in, in a way that, you know, all the years that I've spent in the university, in academia, debating atheists, agnostics, Christians, Jews, uh, Muslims, all kinds, Hindus, Buddhists, what I have noticed is that there is a universal set of truths good, that everybody unanimously agrees upon, which are not to be debated upon. The principles. The principles of promoting good. For example, even a pathological criminal will hide under the garb of good to promote the evil. Because it's naturally repulsive for the inner conscious of the human being for somebody to publicly state that I'm an evil person and I like to promote evil. I want your support. You won't get it. Even presidents of the United States and nations that invade other countries and rob all their resources, hide under the garb of democracy and trying to protect national security and freedom. But you notice, it all comes under the garb of some kind of good that we can protect ourselves under and then we carry all the crimes that we want. So people have confusion after that because they think there's something good hidden. So notice, the universal good is fixed. So let me establish one fundamental principle. Many of times, some atheists try to argue that morality is, is a concoction of the human race. We have created the moral system, which is nonsense. If we have created it, then let's uncreate it. Try it. For example, if speaking the truth is superior to lying, let's flip it for a moment. Let's all vote today, and we're all going to be liars, and we're going to refuse to be truthful. It will work. It's absurd. So it's not something that is within our jurisdiction. It's beyond our jurisdiction. It's not within our control. There is something higher that controls us all. Even the atheist knows that morality cannot be derived scientifically. There is no methodology known to man where I can go through the empirical sciences and derive morals. It's impossible. I cannot study morals through chemistry, physics, biology, Okay, astronomy, there is no such thing as moral system in pure sciences. Pure science is just an empirical observation system, and then we can do what we want with it, but there's always an ethical body that controls the sciences. Always. Why is that the case? Because ethics is ultimately the, the trump card of all conversations. So to give you an example, if I knew the secrets of the entire universe, if I knew how exactly every subatomic particle worked through my scientific observations, and I had the ability to crack all the secrets of the universe, and obviously I'd be a very powerful person, that does not therefore conclude that I'm the best human being on Earth. Though I could be the richest man in the world, the most powerful person in the world, the most knowledgeable person in the world, I could still be a detestable human being because if my morals are not good, then all that I possess 
ceases to hold me up with any dignity. Whereas flip it the other way, a person who knows very little, is very lay, cannot even read or write, but has a high moral status, you ask any human being, Muslim, non-Muslim, they'll tell you that that individual is superior to the one who has all the knowledge of the universe, but cannot keep his mouth clean when he or she speaks, or cannot keep his hands in the right place at the right time. So what is it about our moral obligations that you and I have to have? That when we talk about nasiha, nasiha meaning to talk about giving sound advice to ourselves and to our friends around us. Often we think that as Muslims it's an obligation for us to go and tell everyone else how true Islam is. This is common in all religions, by the way. You will find that in the Christian faith you have ecclesiastical societies where the evangelists feel that it's their obligation to go knock, knocking door to door to try to proselytize and bring people towards Jesus as the Son of God. And I respect that. That's their, they feel that that's their obligation in order to spread the truth because they believe in that truth. Okay? Just like anybody else who tried to promote Buddhism or Islam or for that matter. And we all agree with that. And it should be. So when I have Christians who come to my door, the evangelicals, or when I have Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door, I, I'm always delighted to have them. Now some people feel repulsed by them. They feel, oh my God, this person's going to give me a headache now. But I feel delighted. For the reason that I look at them and I say, you know, how much effort does it take to get out, especially when I get in you come out of the cold on Sundays, you know, you can be relaxing and sleeping, and you're dressed so nicely, it must have taken you some time to get dressed up. And then you come with your Bible and you knock at my door as a group with a smile to try to bring me closer to your way of pathway. I respect that. I said, thank you for taking the time to do so. But I feel it's an obligation for me to reciprocate. Since you have given me a gift with the intention of guiding me, I would like to reciprocate with my gift. So come inside and let's have coffee and we'll talk. <laughs> and it's a very interesting scenario that takes place thereafter, of course, as you know. But I believe that when people see that, even though we don't agree, I make it very clear in my principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us unique in each one of us. And Allah the Quran mentions, if we wanted, we could make all of you as Muslims, submissive, one religion, monolithic society. But that's not the intent of Allah creating us that way. Allah created us on this earth for a purpose and a reason. Okay? Allah says, He created Allah Khalaq al Mawta wa al Hayata liabluakum and yuku asal amala. Wa al he created death and life to test which of us is best in deed. And the sacredness of maintaining an individual's autonomy, the limited freedom that we possess, to be able to choose our own destiny is the highest level of mercy Allah has kept for us to participate that when we do enter paradise, it wasn't on a crutch where he threw us in there, but we participated to walk towards it. And I think that is the highest form of mercy given upon us besides our existence. So therefore, when a person believes in a different religion, we must respect that. Our obligation is to find the commonality. And that's why I love the Quran so much. The Holy Quran is the only book to me as a Muslim. And I've read various scriptures in my life uh, where the language of the Quran is most unique. No book like that in the world. It is a universal book. It's the book that addresses all issues without choosing a particular group against another. You read about Musa, salam, Allah is telling Musa, go, take the many Israel away from Pharaoh. Look, we're talking about the children of Israel. Israel is Yahoo, as you know. Quran is not holding back and saying, look, these are the many Israel who gave problems to prophets. But they were also a chosen people in a community that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a conferred responsibility upon them, just like we as Muslims today have a responsibility. And yet the Quran doesn't hold that back. A whole chapter on Maryam, the mother of Jesus, alayhi salam. The Quran doesn't hold back to say, oh, you know what, you've got a, uh, an axe to grind with the Christians, so we're going to turn a blind eye to the whole immaculate you know, conception in the sense of the birth of Isa, alayhi salam. Uh, without a father. 
No, the Quran is emphatic about it. And it says, you know, this is what happened about Isa. This is what Isa did. This is how it happened. Isa ibn Maryam, qawl al the Quran said. This is what Isa is. There's nothing to hold back. And me as a Muslim, I'm reading, I'm living in a, in a, in a very pluralistic society of religions. And I, I'm reading this Quran and it's telling me that don't think you are better just because someone in your neighborhood has rejected me. No. You have an obligation now that that one in your neighborhood who doesn't believe in me may not believe in me because he's a victim of history that they have been misrepresented and they are so confused about what is wrong and right. And if you think you can pontificate thinking that paradise awaits you and the rest of you go to hell, well, you're going to wake up and smell the coffee on Judgment Day to find out that's exactly not the truth. Our obligation is to realize that the deen of Allah is one. In the deen of Allah is Islam. The deen to relate to Allah, the religion to Allah is Al-Islam. There is no other religion. Al-Islam. But what is Al-Islam? It's got protocols. And what makes Islam the universal religion that addresses the issues of atheism? It addresses the issues of Christians and Jews. Okay, and agnosticism. It addresses everything. It lays the foundation of the very purpose of why we exist, what our obligation is, and the Quran does it in such an elegant way to ensure that when we do talk to people who don't believe in what we believe in, that there is a demeanor by which we must address them with such care that if we violate that, it's like Machiavelli that states that who cares about the means, it's the end that counts. No, we're not Machiavellians. We're Muslims. And if you read the Quran, you see, that's why Allah says, Udri la said, you're not even hikmah. Invite them with wisdom. Wisdom requires careful articulation of words. That when you're looking at that individual, that person may have some secret concepts. And I do not want to trample on the secret concepts. And if I do, I seek protection with the person saying, forgive me if I say that. There's an adab, there's an akhlaq. But what is fundamental in this conversation today is it's, as much as we want to go out and proselytize our belief, because you know, we always love when someone becomes a Muslim. So oh, really, the child of SubhanAllah, MashaAllah. That's fantastic, let's celebrate. Really? Yeah, this is amazing, this is, this is proof. Yeah, but then when we're Muslims and we're asked to give up one bad deed, it's, it's the hardest thing to do. One way Muslim. But then we're so excited when a non-Muslim becomes a Muslim. You know what a giant leap that was? But for us to make one change, you know, we, we, we fight with each other, we find faults in each other, but we're so excited when people become Muslim. Where is the problem? The problem lies in us. I believe the worst enemy to an individual is not an external force. It's the internal force. You and I are the worst enemies of ourselves. And if you and I do not come to terms with that and come to realization that there is a universal message, a universal principle that you and I have to, to share with the world, not with the intent of converting on anybody. But I have conversations with my Christian friends and brethren and Jews and atheists. I said, my intent is not to convert you or to bring you to Islam. It's not my obligation. My obligation is to tell you what I believe is the truth. And if you feel that your truth is better than mine, then how to go how to go to Islam. Bring your proof, lay it on the table, if you're truthful, and let's decide sincerely to agree to disagree agreeably. Now, if we follow those principles, look at the harmony that comes about. Now we are focused. You know, as a scientist going to lab, and when we're studying, we're doing research, I see Hindus with me, atheists, Christians, and it's amazing how much harmony we have in our conversations. It's amazing that we are from different faiths, yet we have a protocol. And that protocol implies that we're going to talk about scientific issues, and I will disagree with you vociferously, and we respect each other. And no one takes umbrage to the idea that, excuse me, you disagree with me, you know, you're going to go to hell. No. We don't have that. We respect each other. Okay. I, I respectfully disagree with you. Thank you. It's academic. Now, why can't we follow the same protocol in our faith? It's almost like somehow we feel that God has conferred that authority upon us by which to adjudicate judgment on somebody, on a person, and you're going to go to hell if you're not on my path. Who authorized you? 
Where in the Quran will Allah ever say, O oh, mankind, you have the authority to pass judgment on judgment day as to who is going to enter paradise and who is not? Who? We recite as Muslims ten times a day. Maliki Yawmid Deen, master of the day of judgment. Who is the master? You and I or the God who created us? Who gave us that authority? Now look at the protocols in Islam. This is why I love the Quran. The universal principle, you notice, Quran is talking about justice, equity, peace. Even the name Islam, to me, it's an ayin I speak all around the world. Islam today has been associated with terrorism. To me, this is an irony. This is like, I scratch my head. I say it's the only religion in the world whose name means submission and peace. It's a verb and a noun that is so positively proactive that if all of us as Muslims got together, we could not name it the way Allah named it. Allah says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa radeetu lakum al islam deena. Allah says to the Prophet, when he completed his mission, he said, Today I perfected for your religion and made it complete. And we call it Al Islam. You know, all religions in the world today are not named like this. They're all named after a person or an object. All major religions are named after a person. Think about it. Amazing. Do you know that they even tried to make us fall into that trap? That if you go back to the historians in the early centuries of the 19th and the 20th century, they do not call us Muslims. They call us Muhammadans. Mm -hmm. But we as Muslims, 14 centuries, never called ourselves Muhammadans. Why this effort? Because they knew this name is so powerful and universal that if people understood its value, it would penetrate the heart of every individual on earth. So this deen, al-Islam, is named strategically. We're told our religion has been spread with the sword. That's the accusation. I grew up in this country. I know. I was taught that in school. Now, I'm going to point a finger at my professor for teaching me that. They were probably misinformed. When somebody comes and attacks my religion, I don't look at that person as an enemy. I say, maybe you're confused. Maybe you've been misinformed. Let me try to at least correct it. Then, if you insist on your, uh, on your animosity, then I can consider you to be a true enemy. Maybe I have to give you this option that you're innocent and you're guilty. You know, the entire Quran does not have the word safe in it. Safe in Arabic means sword. The word sword does not exist in the entire Quran cover to cover. Wow. That to me, when I say to my you know, professors who argue with me, I said, you know, if my religion was spread with a sword, then God should tell me what, what size it should be, how sharp it should be, how many sides it should have, what the handle should be, what the weight limitation should be, what kind of metal I should use, and how should I slice, and where should I slice. Because that should be part of my quote-unquote sharia. <laughs> it doesn't exist. They all stopped by that. I said, mm hmm, interesting. I said, you know, I don't need to get on a bandwagon to defend and be an apologetic. I'm placing the evidence on the table and I'd like for you to disprove it. But what I love about religion towards God is its universal principle. For God is the universal owner. And therefore his principles must be universal. It cannot be limited to a select group of people. The meaning the avenue to reach him should be open for all. There are avenues. There is a deen of Allah, agreed, but it should be accessible and open for all, and the potential should be open for all. And that universal principle is the driving force of nasiha, brothers and sisters, that I'm going to stress on between us and in this conversation, inshallah, in the Quran, we should talk about it. And fundamentally, our obligation is to take nasiha upon ourselves first. You know, as much as you and I would love to have others become good people, it's useless if you and I are not committed to it. Because I think at the end of the day, it's upon ourselves. Allah says, Ya yuladin amun hu anfusaku wa ahlikum na. Meaning, save yourselves and your family from the fire of hell. You need to save yourselves. Because when you and I save ourselves, we don't need to preach much. Our actions will speak louder than words. And that's going to be the greatest nasiha in the challenging world that we live in, that you and I will ever achieve. When a person 
puts it in action, it speaks louder than the one who preaches and does not practice. Quran says, Lima taquluna ma la taf'alun. Why do you say that which you don't do? Kaburat ma ta'inna Allah an taquluna ma la taf'alun. It's detestable to Allah that you say that which you don't do. So Nasiha, look at Surah Tahrim. Look at the, the elegance of the Quran, verse after verse. Gems. SubhanAllah, I say it not to patronize my Muslim community. I say this in public across the world. I'm not afraid. And I stand to the challenge. The elegance of the Quran and how it addresses it is what is the conversation here. For if you and I feel energized that there is this incredible guidance, the greatest miracle that ever came, if I ask miracles, you know, prophets perform miracles. What miracle did your last prophet perform? People ask me this question. What miracle did your prophet perform? You know, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did he perform? People ask me that question. I said, his greatest miracle is the Quran. He said, but that's a book, scriptures. I said, that's it. He said, what do you mean? Jesus walked on the water. Jesus brought the dead back to life. I said, I agree with that. That's true. Quran even upholds it. Quran even states it. That he brought the dead back to life. In fact, Jesus was the only person that we know of, at least in the Quran, that spoke in the cradle. And his moral standard was so high that there's a reason, a hikmah, there's a wisdom as to why Isa spoke in the cradle. Do you know that? Just like when Musa salam, had the power of the stick to turn to a snake, there was a reason for that. Allah, Allah doesn't just give miracles to impress us. There is a practical reason to give that miracle. Otherwise, Allah doesn't give it. So that miracle was given to Musa. The miracle of Isa to speak in the cradle. But I asked my Christian brethren, you know, our Jewish brethren, I say, when Moses performed that act with, in front of the Pharaoh, it was a fantastic act, no question about it. In the Quran, brings it in the most elegant way to try to explain it to us that the magicians who were the instrument of Pharaoh were so touched by the trueness of the snake that Musa's snake was real that if the magician is turned you can't argue because it's the magician who knows the tricks and if he knows Musa alayhi trick is not a trick then what greater argument can you bring from the Qur'an that if the magicians become believers, what else is left to argue? There's no room for argument. Now when Jesus salam, brings the dead back to life, and those events that take place, notice in the scope of time, the gravity of that miracle fades over time. It becomes more hearsay. So if you and I witness a dead person, like Lazarus, coming back to life, and you and I witnessed it, I would say in a scale of intensity, no one has a greater right to feel impressed by the miracle than the one who witnessed it. Especially Lazarus himself. No one can be a better representative. But Lazarus's grandchildren, do you think they would have the same intensity? No. The great-grandchildren, the intensity fades over time. So the intent of that miracle with Isa was simply temporal at that moment. Though it is essential, it's very important, and the Quran mentions it. But in comparison, when you bring a miracle forward like the Quran, which grows in time, then try to bring a better miracle than that. Now people ask, what's the miracle of the Quran? We'll talk about that, inshallah. First and foremost, just from a cursory observation, without going into details, we ask ourselves, all the scriptures that I've ever read, from the Buddhists, to the Christians, to the Jews, to all those who have some divine uh, revelation from a deity, there is somebody talking on behalf of God. Interesting. Even when you look at the letters of Paul to the Greeks, you find it's Paul, through inspiration, talking for God. Interesting. But I asked my Christian brother that God did not appoint Paul. How do I know he's real? This is when he got inspiration. So a human being can just, from the blue, fall into place and simply mention something 
and you just re reiterate it over and over, it becomes canonical, it becomes divine. Is that the system of God? As a scientist, how do I break that backwards to validate whether or not this is real, or whether or not you and I have simply accepted it as an article of faith when in fact it lacks credibility? What is happening to me as a Muslim is when I look at the Quran, there is no place that anyone talks but Allah. Even the messenger of Allah, who is the most important person after Allah. The messenger of Allah has so much authority on the believers, and the Quran says, An Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min al fasiyah. The, the, the Prophet has greater right on the believers than the believers have upon themselves. Wow, this is incredible. It means somebody has a greater right on me than myself. Allah says, An Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina. That's how great he is. Then when the Prophet says something, it's the haq, it's Allah talking. Wow. The Prophet speaks nothing of himself, that which is revealed to him. SubhanAllah. Even then, the Prophet does not say a word of his own sentence in the Quran. Not a word. When people ask him questions, he was silent. Allah says to him, Qul, say. He say, say. Now, why is the Prophet not saying, look, I'm the Prophet of God, I've been chosen. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dumb deal. So let me give you a few of my inspirational talks to you, and let me be part of the canonical book. I mean, that would be okay, logical. But the standard of Allah, when He grants guidance to mankind, it is so supreme that even the Messenger of God, who is the most supreme person, Allah says, hasana. In the Messenger of God is the best example for you. Even then He can't do that. I said, wow, I see the beauty of this religion that in its delivery, nobody could infiltrate it. I love that. Meaning the, the crime scene has not been adulterated. I like it. Now I can be the judge. Let me be the judge after that. Because if you, if a person interferes in the evidence, then it becomes blurry. You know the court of law, as sophisticated as it may be, would have to deem it as a mistrial. It's impossible because you say, it's been tainted. I don't know what to do with it. My judgment could be totally opposite. So I want to see how the Quran says beautifully in Surah Tahrim. It says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha, asa rabbukum an yukaffir ankum sayyatikum, wa yudkhilakum jannatin tajri min tahti lalhaw, yawma la yukhzi allahu nabi wa ladhina amanu ma'ahu. نورهم يسعى بين أيديهم وبأيمانهم يقولون ربنا أسلمنا نورنا وفرنا إنك على كل شيء قدير. Look how Allah says, all you who have, who you believe, repent to Allah, meaning sincerely turn to Allah, توبة نصوحة. Turn to Allah with a sincere turning. Meaning Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is challenging us. If you want to represent me, point a finger at yourself and purify yourself and turn to me with a sincere turn. Tawbah ten nasuha. Tawbah in Arabic meaning to turn. Taba, to turn, to turn to its origin, to go back to its origin. Tawbah ten nasuha. Sincerely turn to me. Okay. What does Allah say? Perhaps your Lord will remove your misdeeds. Meaning Allah will wipe out our misdeeds. He says, and admit you to gardens beneath which rivers flow. On the day of judgment, Allah will not disgrace the Prophet and those who are with him. And Allah says the following. In those who believe with him, their light will proceed before them. And on the right, they will say, perfect for us our light. Now, we are living in the wax. We have a situation where many a times when we talk about Islam, when we talk about Islam, many a times we have two kinds of people. We have those who feel that they're so on the right path that they have to force everyone around them to be on their path. And we're so strict and restrictive that we are very quickly passing judgments about everybody else. And when we study that, Part of the reason is not necessarily because they want to do that, 
But it's because they feel that if they don't do that, maybe they don't believe in God as much. You know how sometimes we're so rigid and strict that stuff oh, I cannot be this, this is haram, I cannot. And we pass judgment so quickly that we repulse people. And we basically try to say to people, I'm on such a holy pathway, please don't take it. And either you be on my holy pathway or get out of my life. Because I'm in paradise. I don't care about you. Imagine if this is an attitude. The messengers of Allah never say these things. Never. The messenger, when he was in Mecca, he never had this attitude. Even that woman, that old woman of the Prophet was helping her carry the water from the well from her house, she says, you're a good young man. And in this age and time, there are very few young men like you who care for the old. So I'm advising you. There's a man by the name of Muhammad. He's a magician. He talks with tongues. Be very careful with him, because he'll mesmerize you. Now the Prophet doesn't drop the water and say, excuse me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He's simply not. He's looking at the woman and saying, she means well. She has a good heart. She's vilifying me. But she is misinformed. Now look at the adab and the akhlaq of Nasir of advice. The Prophet doesn't get into a discussion with excuse me, baby, let's sit down, let's have a discussion about Tawheed, why idolatry is haram. You know, let's get into eschatology and talk about the future of the universe and where we're going with heaven and hell. No conversation whatsoever. Very simplistic. And he's suddenly elegant, he walks with her to the house, puts the pail down, and says, that man that you've been talking about is me. She says, if such a man exists like you with such an adult, then I bear witness there is no God but only you are the Messiah of God. Now, why does she do that? Because the Messiah, the advice, is crystal clear and sincere in the face of a person. How could you reject such a person? And you know what's fascinating? That our purity to ourselves is the most powerful Messiah you and I will ever give to anyone. But I would like to advise us all. There is nothing worse than ignorance. If you're not ignorant, and you really want to get close to Allah, trust me, we're going to go backwards, thinking we're going towards Allah. We will hug our brothers and crush their lungs because we love them so much. And kill them. This is what's happening today. I see a lot of apathy in our Muslim brothers and sisters. I was just at Cornell University speaking recently, and I was gathering with a lot of these very bright students, and there was a prevalence of agnosticism and atheism coming towards me. This is not talking about atheistic students, we're talking about a Muslim group questioning the integrity of God's existence. And I look at them and say, are you serious about this? They said, yeah, because you know, this is how academics are, you know, this is how we're, we're taught. And I said, taught with what? So I challenged them, asked them a few questions, they couldn't answer. I said, so where is your answer? No, we never thought that way. I said, look at how myopic your vision is. And you've become apathetic towards religion. And therefore, and it looks more glittery and more bright on the other side of the divine, and you think, oh, that's the way to go. And therefore, you start to give up this, and suddenly you become a PhD, you become a doctor, you're making six and seven figure salaries, you see, you think, I don't need God, I'm smart enough, I can figure things out myself. No. No. The moral argument is the, the most profound argument possibly ever brought forth. Look, statistically, the large, the, the most, and I'm, I'm not generalizing it, I'm just saying statistically, but some of the largest um, users of drugs, what we call contraband material, illicit drugs, are in the wealthy echelon of the society. Depression is very high among the wealthy. The psychiatrists who do a lot of therapy are usually for the wealthy. Why? I thought if I possess a lot of wealth and I live in a glittery house in a nice palace, I should be the happiest person in the world. And if I'm so smart and I'm a doctor or whatever, and if I have a large audience that when I speak in my field, the world considers me to be a great leader, and I don't have my moral calmness, my understanding of what my obligations are in life, you think I would be a happy person? No. Ask any individual. They will tell you that the the, the most sound society is the one that has gauged their future. What is my future? Why am I here? And if it's the acquisition of wealth, which is an obligation upon us, and that's my goal, 
Well, then it doesn't work because I've never seen a person, including the Pharaoh, ever take the gold with him. So then what's my purpose? Is there a higher order to life? And if there is this higher order, how am I going to achieve it? And to me, when you boil it down, it's very simple and it's looking at us. What's looking at us? The moral argument. <coughs> Promotion of good, forbidden so evil. How do I know what that is? Well, if you, if you examine that, you will see that that has to come from a higher authority. Has to. Because when a human being sets those parameters, you and I will put ourselves on the top of the totem pole, and it will disrupt the harmony of society. You find all, all groups of people claim they're chosen people, superior of others, and they look down on other races. Those are usually the troublemakers of the world. Examine it. You see, they will steal, they will, shoot, they will kill, they will look down, they will belittle, they will marginalize, they'll cause all kinds of imbalances. But when a human being sees that, no, we're all on the same platform, and we are only chosen when we submit to Allah and maintain a good moral conduct, and while I maintain a good moral conduct, then I'm chosen, that's a whole different equation now. Because I cannot be condescending, I cannot look down upon you, I cannot be harsh, I cannot be selfish, I cannot be a bigot. Because if I do any of the above, I lose my position. Aha, uh -huh. now that's a whole different equation. And that's the argument. And Allah SWT is showing us. I give a simple example with respect. Go to India today. You've got Brahmins and you've got the Harijans. Harijans are the untouchables. These people are in such abject state of existence that even rats live better than they do. How come? Such an intelligent society, brilliant, running the IT world today. How can you have such a variance of society when you have a man building a billion dollar house and across the street you got a shanty town where a person is living in the gutter? How is it possible? Because well, the system has been delineated that I'm the chosen, you're not. Aha, but can a God do such a thing? Such a God is not worthy of worship. No, God is universal, He's merciful, He's giving and forgiving. And Allah SWT created us all, not for help, He created us for paradise. Otherwise, we would not have existed. But He honored us with limited free will to participate in it. And I believe that destiny that lies in our own hands to decide our own future is so pivotal that the first line of attack towards evil is for you and I to realize that that authority lies in our hands. So when we give advice to our friends, the first thing you have to say is, I have to advise myself. Do I feel it? Do I resonate with it? And when I see a brother, even if they're going astray, don't be harsh against them. Harshness is when someone is harsh. Even that is with limitation. Give me an example. You know, look at this is why I love the Quran and I will conclude. You know, Let's take for own. In the Quran, by, by Abrahamic faith, one of the most detestable human beings in the history of mankind was the Pharaoh, who came in the time of Musa. He was so arrogant that he declared himself God. He considers himself so powerful that he was going to challenge the decree of Allah. Because the soothsayers have told him that among the children of Israel, one will be born who will destroy you. He asked the soothsayers, what do you mean? He says, you will be the firstborn. He says, go out with my soldiers and kill all the firstborn among the children of Israel. But he's right. So how many infants were grabbed and beheaded? How many? Thousands. They say. Hundreds of them. Thousands. Think about it. Innocent lives taken. But did the Pharaoh care? No. To the extent that even when the magicians become Muslims, he said to them, I did not authorize you to become Muslim. I haven't given you permission. Look how arrogant he was. And the magicians replied, when Allah created us, we didn't take your permission. We don't need you. So he could have killed them, crucified them, as you know. They became shuhada, they became martyrs. This is the arrogance of this man. Now Allah SWT is telling Musa, look how Allah plans it. He says, this arrogant man thinks will fight my decree. I tell you a lesson for you and I to learn. 
So when you and I ever move in the direction of arrogance, take the lesson of Pharaoh. And don't think it only happens to Pharaoh. It happens to all of us. It believes it happened to him. And Allah put him in such a unique position and then dropped him. They say the higher you go, the harder you fall. So, Pharaoh, Musa alayhi salam, is brought into the house of Pharaoh. Wow. This is the man killing the firstborn. Allah says, look, wa makkal wa makkal Allah, wa khayr wa You plan, Allah plans. He's the best of planners. You want to challenge Allah? Okay. So the name is brought into the house of Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh raises Musa. SubhanAllah. Look how Allah says, he thinks he can go out there and kill people and stop my decree? Impossible. You cannot do that. When God decrees a man exists to be, Musa becomes an adult. Look at the planning, right? But he, this is the piece that I want to I stress on, and then I will conclude, inshallah. When Musa is told to go, اذهب إلى فرعون إن مطغى اسم الطاهر Allah says to him, Musa, when you and your brother, when you talk to the Pharaoh, bear in mind who the Pharaoh is, I've established it for you. He is a fiend, he is a megalomaniac, he's a mass murderer, he's an arrogant fool, he's ignorant, and you cannot put more negatives on this man than the way Pharaoh was. Now you and I as Muslims today, we feel that when someone's doing something haram, you know, we go and Look down upon their throats and says, Stuff for Allah, you're going to hell, you know. This is my way to slap slap. Why? Well, I have to do this, brother. If I don't wake you up with a slap or a punch, you will go to hell. <laughs> oh, you've been authorized. Stuff for Allah. Of course I've been authorized. That's why I'm here. <laughs> is that the other in Islam? I challenge any Muslim in the world to bring me one verse in the Quran where Allah authorizes such behavior. There is no such thing. Allah They swallow their anger, they forgive mankind, Allah loves the good doers. Tell me, where did the Quran ever say, go up to that arrogant fool and punch him and slap him and shoot him and say, Allah Akbar. <laughs> where? Yet we have ignorant so-called Muslims today who do this with a gun and say, Allah Akbar, who authorized him? Jihad. <laughs> really? A prophet of God who Allah spoke to, Kareem Allah, the one who Allah spoke to directly, Musa alayhi salam, is not authorized to do that. Allah says to him, Awlallayna, Musa, when you talk to Fir'aun, speak a soft tongue so that you will inspire him to realize what is wrong. Allah, Fir'aun, the worst human being, a prophet who has a stick, can simply turn into a snake and go on his neck like a, you know, and just wrap it and just choke him to death. <laughs> Look at that. Take a stick and just throw it at him and zap him, right? And pulverize him and make him to stone. No. Allah says, when you go talk to him, speak to him with a soft tongue. How will that make him? Soft. Maybe you will inspire him to come close to me. Allah. That verse in Surah Taha absolutely makes my, my spine shiver. Well, Allah subhanahu wa is saying to me, Hassanayn, your demeanor in Islam, should be in a pastor of prophets like this, that you have no authority to give nasiha to anyone but yourself. And when you do, you do with kindness. Even if that is the ardent enemy of God, Allah says, they all come back to me. Allah says, in the Quran, it says, <laughs> When they reject you, they reject me, don't let it bother you. They're all coming back to me, Allah said, and I will tell them what they have done. Then, if they are really wrong, I will punish them with a severe punishment. This is not upon us. So I conclude today, brothers and sisters, that our challenge as Muslims is to have a firm grounded in Tawheed. When we speak to atheists and atheists say, there is no God, I don't see God, so no God, let's talk about it. Bring sound arguments, it doesn't take much, trust me. I've been doing this for 20 plus years. You have a Christian who says you're going to be saved through the blood of Christ. I said, yeah, Jesus is the Savior. My suggestion to you, follow, walk, talk, live like Jesus. Be like him, don't for anyone else. Nobody other than that. Look at Jesus, 
and just focus on him. What he says you do. Don't follow anyone else. Really? You don't want to become Muslim? I said, no. You do that, you will be Muslim. <laughs> because if you follow Jesus the way it is, you're all Muslim. Because Isa, Ibrahim, Hanif are Muslim and they're all Muslims. What's the issue? Wow, this is amazing. I said, yeah. I speak to my Jewish friend. Be like Moses. Really? The problem is not for me. And you know, the thing is about Isa, they said, what I like about my Christian brother is they consider Jesus to be infallible. To be a perfect human being. It's great, perfect. That's exactly what you want to be. It's like the way I see my prophet. All the prophets are like So when they see that, now we're not challenging, we're finding common grounds. And I believe Allah has laid the foundation of commonality in all of us. As Muslims and non-Muslims, we all have common roots. Find it. 90% of it is common. It's the 10% maybe not that is too much. And we become experts on the 1%, the 2%, the 10%. Yeah, but you disagree with me here, and therefore you are not like to be friend. I say, identical twins don't agree on everything. A son born of a mother's flesh does not agree with his mother on everything. Show me two human beings who agree on everything. I'd like to find that person. There's no such person in the world. If you've got a brain to make your own choices, impossible. So then where do we go? Oh, disagreement is the spice to life. Exactly. Play with it. Bring it forth and bring the Quran. That's the trial on judgment day. May Allah reward you all, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for your time. And if you can give me your silence for a few minutes, so that I can answer and then, and then we can do this very fast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Intelligence. Well, intelligence is, is, is not an attribute that can be seen directly as you know. Intelligence can only be seen directly. There's no way to look at intelligence directly. Well, one of the thing, one of the aspects of intelligence is language. And one of the aspects of the core component of language is encode decode. Like I'm speaking, I'm encoding, and your brain is decoding. It's a sign of intelligence. This is why we say that DNA is an intelligent molecule. Because it has the power to enter the ego, that it's an intelligent entity. And it's, it's, it's created very intelligently. So that's just a quick explanation of intelligence. And akal, as we call it, has many dimensions. The highest form of akal is hikmah, when you have wisdom. Because wisdom is the power to connect the dots. So I have many snippets of knowledge, but if I don't know what to do with it, then my intelligence causes confusion. But if I have wisdom, and I have a bird's eye view, then I know how to interconnect. My belief, honestly, just to make a quick comment, I believe every human being on earth has the pieces necessary to reach Allah. But if I was to draw, for example, you ever see children have the connected dots? We have a picture with dots. And typically when a child is drawing the connected dots game, it's numbered. It's one, two, three, four, five. Well, that numbering system, I call it Hikmah, wisdom. Most people in the world don't have numbers. They have the dots, they don't have the numbers. So they interconnect the wrong way and they get a different picture. And a wise person does not recreate the person. All you do is disconnect the connections and reconnect. So you're getting a new perspective on life. And that's what life is about. So Allah says, يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْنٍ كَثِيرًا God gives wisdom to who He wills. And when He gives it, He's given much good to it. So intelligence at the highest level is when you and I ponder, we try to make sense of the universal principles of Allah, we follow protocols, we establish a firm grounding for ourselves, then we reach the level of hikmah. And when you have hikmah, you are the most powerful person in the world. 100%. That's intelligence. Why did Isa speak in the cradle? That's an excellent question. I'll answer it very quickly. It's common protocol in the human race, biologically speaking, that it takes two to bring a child. You have a mother and a father. It's common protocol. It's not usual. It's in fact totally unusual for a woman to bring forth a child without a father. Now, if a modern woman today decided to do that, and she decides to bring a baby and says, I conceive this child, Immaculately. Nobody in the world would believe them. 
Because every know there's a guy hidden somewhere. <laughs> and that's common knowledge. In fact, it's absurd to say, oh really, you mean God is praying? Oh well, subhanAllah, wonderful. No, I've never seen a woman give birth without a name, so I don't believe you. Now when Mary, Mariam is given this good news, you see that you will have a son. He says, how? When no man has touched me. So Isa bin Jibrail says, I'm not afraid that my God decrees. She says, but she's thinking, how? How is this going to happen? Now look at the, the, the social dynamics of it. That when a child is brought forth, as pure as a woman is like Mary, Mariam, the purest woman on earth at that time, the purest, in Mustafa ki wanda harati, I will decide on Alami. Among all women, the purest woman is Mariam. Imagine, when she brings this child, the baby, as soon as it's born, starts to sleep. فَنَادَاهَا مِنْ تَحْكِيَا أَنْ لَا تَحْزَنِي قَدْ جَعَلَ رَبُّكِ تَحْتَكِ صَرِيَا Wow! Baby saying, Mother, don't worry. God has put a river on your foot. Can you imagine a mother giving birth to a baby and talking to you? <laughs> That's profound. In my mind, it blows my mind. But here's the argument. The argument is very simple. If a woman is brought without, brings a child without a father, it's impossible to prove it. Impossible. Unless it comes from the child's mother. But even if an angel came down, he says, I bear witness, this woman, no man touched her. Who are you? <laughs> but imagine the baby talking. Boy, you just blow it out of the water. There is no argument after that, huh? So when she brings the baby, look at the argument. The Quran elegantly lays it out. I'm telling you, what I love about the Quran, it is the most succinct book on earth. It's perspicuous, meaning to the point, lucid, no room for argument. Even the story of Yusuf, it starts from point A to point B within 6 to 18 verses. It brings the entire story of Yusuf. Wow. You have movies that last for hours and can't finish it. But that's the beauty of the Quran. So when she brings the baby, he said, Ya Ukhta Harun, ma kana abu ki ra sa'in, wa ma kanat ummu ki baghiya. Wow, look at the people, they're establishing. Oh, sister of Harun, your mother and father were pure. Bingo, Quran is setting the standard. Get it? The accusers now are admitting, this woman is so pure, don't argue about this anymore. Don't ever entertain the idea that she even had any level of indecency. Number one. So then she says, then she points to the baby. The reply, look at the beautiful reply. She says, Wow, how should we speak to a baby in the cradle? Quran is establishing. It's not common. It's not usual. Babies don't talk. <laughs> Brilliant. Suddenly the baby speaks. <laughs> وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حي وبرا بوالدتي. واو. Look at how Isa speaks. He's a baby. People are grown up. I mean, they look at us. Oh my God, this is a miracle. This baby is talking. Now, you have any arguments to go to the mother and say, Excuse me, there's a man? No, it's finished. Done deal. You know, when a man, I was, I was having a debate with an atheist who asked me this question. He says, You know, so this is like the chicken and the you know, fox talking, right? Like the baby speaks in the cradle, right? Time to belittle it. I said, you can belittle all you want when a baby can speak in the cradle. To you, it sounds fantasy, Hollywoodish. I said, but when you read the story of the chicken and the hen, do you question whether a chicken or a hen can talk? Or do you take the moral lesson from it? He says that. I said, my advice to you, even if you don't agree that a baby can speak, take the moral lesson from it, maybe it will be used to good. Wow. He looks back and says, did you get it? Look at what the baby did. Protected his mother, declared his prophethood, and made sure no human being dares ever accuse her of an indecent act. Look at the hikmah. Quran said, he says, that is the of the Maria. You know, when I read this, I cried. I have read the scripture of the Christian Bible, and I, I respect my Christian brother. Jesus' first miracle, is when he turns water into wine when he was in his late 20s. It's the first miracle Jesus performed. Some Christians believe that, and by the way, if you read the Catholic ideology, they say the Virgin Mary betrothed a man by the name of Joseph, who was a carpenter. 
And she walks around with Joseph like as if she's married to him. And I say, you cannot do that. This is a birth of a pure child that does not need a man to camouflage this incredible miracle. And you're belittling it. Because if there's a Joseph, the carpenter involved, you're, you're killing the whole equation of this great birth. The Quran is elegantly lazy. He says, this is how it is. Take it or leave it. What do you think? Wow. 14 centuries later, I said, subhanAllah. And to me, what shocks me, with due respect, I'm not, I'm not talking about Jewish, Christian, Islamic differences. We're talking about academics here. That when the Maryam speaks to Jesus in the Bible, she says, we've run out of wine, as you know, in the, in the Feast of Canaan. And Jesus replies, woman, woman, what have you to do before my time is not yet come? I asked the Christian brother, I said, you know, you've interpreted this, I don't know where. How can this great personality of Jesus talk to his great mother, who's such a great woman, there was no woman like her, to call her woman? Which son dares to call his mother woman? So I ask my Christian brother, please, as much as I respect your religion, and I truly believe you love God, maybe more than I do, please don't entertain the idea of a great person like Jesus, who's infallible to dare call his mother woman. For if I had prescribed that religion, how would I get my judgment from God that this God incarnate is talking on earth, talking to his mother this way? But look how the Quran says, Jesus says, well, that wrong day, why didn't he? I have been made kind to my mother. And I'm not insolent to her. And I've been enjoying prayers and fasting and charity. And peace be upon you. Wassalamu alayhi wa yawma ulidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ba'ahariyyatu. Peace be upon me the day I was born, the day I died, the day I was risen. I like that. I mean, not about Islam or not Islam. As a human being, walking around a moral argument, I like to give the morals that way. I'd, I'd rather give this story to my child than the miracle of turning water into wine. I'm a problem. Do we have time or do we have time? Yeah, for two.